So I just wanted to show you <laughs> that what we are be uh, talking about is not just a uh, theory, but it really happens. Uh, so I just uh, run twice in a row our little program that has the three queries, no? one with the uh, all, uh, the other with the get, and the other with the each. Uh, and it happened that the third one in one instance was actually executed here in the middle, and the other case uh, just run twice in a row. It didn't change anything in the middle. Okay, so it really happened even with simple program and simple queries, there's always some degree of uh, uncertainty no? <laughs> about the, the actual execution order of the queries or, or any asynchronous. Mm? So it's not just something that theoretically should be aware, but practically if you write something and you don't take this into account, uh, it, will, it will smash your nose, okay? Okay, so let's see how the, uh, this asynchronous uh, stuff can be you know, managed in a, a bit easier way, okay? Uh, to avoid this uh, called uh, callback hell, uh, this uh, was an example, a very simple example of a set of questions that he wanted to ask, uh, and we know that the answer to every question is in the callback. Uh, and so if you have a, a second question after the first one, I must put the second question in the callback of the first and the third one, the, and so on. And you see all of these uh, you know, callback ends at the end here that makes uh, also understanding the call mm, quite difficult. Every callback adds a level of, of nesting in the call. And the level of nesting is something that is, adds complexity in the code, but especially in, in the programmer's mind. So uh, they defined in uh, 2017, okay, a uh, new a set of uh, a new library, hmm, a new object inside the standard library called uh, a promise. Hmm. And uh, a promise is an object that we can create that uh, remembers uh, some operation that will conclude in the future. Okay, uh, it represents the eventual, sooner or later, completion of an asynchronous operation. So it's not just the callback by itself that will run, and then we'll have a callback. We have an object that, that remembers that we have this function that, that will run, and we can query this object uh, to get uh, its completion statuses, get uh, these error messages, and so on. Okay, so a promise is an object. Uh, I said several times, uh, db.get doesn't return anything. db.tall doesn't return anything. It can return anything, okay? It can return any result. It could return, not db.tall, but the concept of promise is that an asynchronous function call may return an object that remembers that some value will be available sooner or later. And this is a promise. An asynchronous function doesn't return a value, but returns a promise to provide a value. I don't return a value now, I can't return a value now, but I give you a promise, an object, from which you can extract the value later. I promise that the value be, will be available. And so I can, give you, I can return you the promise right now. Just don't ask for the, for the, for the, for the value, for the result yet, okay? Um, so this object is an object that can be returned by functions that have an asynchronous behavior. And this object, this promise object, uh, is able to extract the value or to uh, manage the error in the case some error happens. So a promise corresponds to an asynchronous process that may either succeed or fail. It can be completed with success or completed with failure. In both cases, the promise is completed, but with a good or a bad result. And uh, they have a standard, a promise object gives us a, a standard way of managing this kind of behavior. So every library, every function we declare always uh, 
uh, uses this kind of office. And uh, the other, um, so instead of having every library having a different convention or on how to get the error, how to pass the error object, and so on, they standardize that. And they integrated error handling with the providing cache mechanism, by the way. And the interesting part is that you can use a promise to schedule a new operation. And this new operation will only happen when the first promise is fulfilled, is completely with success. With success. success. Um, so we can create a promise and uh, we can you know, consume the result of the, pro of the promise itself. Okay? Um, let's see how it works uh, practically. So I said that promise is a type of object. So we can create a, a promise with a new keyword. New promise. Okay? Uh, the object promise receives one parameter in the constructor function, which is the callback of code, of asynchronous code, that we can execute. Okay, so when you do new promise, I create a callback function with some code. Inside here, we can have a synchronous code. We can have a callback. We can, this will be executed asynchronously. It can be executed asynchronously. Okay? And inside this block of code, we may call two functions. One is called resolve and the other is called reject, which are the first and the second parameter of the promise. Of, uh, callback function. We um, resolve and reject. We can call it as we want, but convention is to call them uh, resolve and reject. Our callback functions, but they are not provided by us. They are provided by the library. Okay? So it's not something that we have to implement. It's something that we may call. So the library already calls our callback function with two instances of resolve and reject that they created for us. What happens is that when we call the function of resolve, we are saying that the promise is fulfilled. So it has a result. And the argument of resolve is the result of the promise itself. While if something goes wrong, we can call the reject function that will complete the promise with a failure information. And the uh, reject will contain the error message or an object that describes the error, what went wrong. So inside this callback, we can do any kind of call. We can have nested callbacks, whatever you want. As long as sooner or later, this function will call resolve or will call reject. Asynchronously, not necessarily in this sequential block of code. So typically here, we will schedule something that will later return a value. So the constructor takes, an, it's called the executor function, the function that will be executed. Asynchronously. Um, and what we do, what do we do with a promise? Then we'll try to convert into promises the code that we wrote before. Um, the promise object, the promise object has two methods, or several methods, but the two most important are one method called then and one method called catch. These are the methods of the promise object. So when I'm storing here this new promise into my promise, my promise now is a then method and a catch method, the object itself, that we can use, the then method can you, we can use to specify a callback 
to be executed on success. And the cache method will specify a callback to be executed on failure. Let's try to put that into our database code. Because maybe it's easier with an example. So imagine the, this one. No? Let's try to convert into promises this one. So let's make a, a separate file so that we don't mix them. DB underscore promise.mjs. So from the DB, we copy the import statement. And uh, we, OK, we create the database, and it's fine. And then we want to, to print the list of users, OK? This one. Um, so what we can use, uh, we, can, we can create, OK? is a promise object that contains, that promises me to give the result of the query. So uh, let's say that all the users, the users list, is a promise. And a promise gets a one callback function, um, resolve, reject, and a body. So I have some result, users, which is not the value of the users, but a promise to get the value. Inside, I will execute the asynchronous code that is needed for getting that value. So it will be, I will execute db.all. Uh, I will uh, select uh, everything from users. And have a callback, uh, because the, data, the SQLite library requires the synchronous callback. Error, rows, and uh, you have if error, if I have an error, Otherwise, and now I know what to do. If I have an error, this promise is failed. Reject the reason. Let's say the error. As rows is the result that we want, uh, resolve rows. We can do also some extra computation, but just the minimal amount of code. So you see that uh, we are not calling reject or resolve into the body of this, of this callback, right? Into the promise body. We have three levels of nesting here. We have the main program, the callback of promise, and the callback of db.all. We are calling reject from the callback of db.all. This reject function is a closure because uh, it's this code will execute in its, in its callback, uh, use the value of reject and the uh, value of resolve that is a parameter of an external function. OK, we know that. It would be useless. Uh, to call uh, resolve or reject uh, from the body of the promise directly. Because that would be synchronous. I'm executing a callback and returning the result. I don't need a promise at all. But we, we are, I'm delaying uh, the call to re resolve until I really have some data to give you. OK? OK, so now users is a variable that we can use right now. Of course, if I try to print it, I don't expect, uh, I don't expect to provide any result. It will just tell me that it's a promise object, node uh, db 
db underscore p. Uh, I have a syntax error where What is that? Uh, ah, from instead of for. Thank you. It's an error that comes from the SQLite parser. It's not a JavaScript syntax, but it's a SQL syntax. From. Okay, it's, it tells me promise pending. So this is a promise object and it's not been fulfilled yet. It's still ongoing. Of course, it's still ongoing. I just printed it after. I, I created that and uh, the query didn't have time to be scheduled yet. The difference between before is that here at line 22, for example, the query has already been scheduled. It didn't execute yet, of course, we don't have the value, but the query is scheduled. Here at line 14 or 15, the promise has been scheduled. This callback has been scheduled. And when it runs, it will schedule the query. So the query is not yet started yet. It's not yet known yet until you start executing the body of the promise, which it will be right now. But right now, after we, we finish this block of sequential code. OK. So we can do anything with this object. But we know that this object will be useful for extracting the result. How? With a callback from this object. So I can say that uh, when the promise finishes, the promise will give me some value, which are the rows. And they can print them. So. I created a promise. Inside the body of promise, I do a lot of work. And my only duty is to call resolve when I have the result. Then the promise object will remember that. And in the future, I can call the then method. Then requires a callback function that will be called when the promise is fulfilled. And it receives as a parameter this callback function, receive a parameter the resolve value. So whatever I put into this resolve argument here goes into this callback argument. And now I run it. And I see that online. Uh, uh, 18, I'm printing this data. So, uh, the, everything is still asynchronous, right? I, may, I didn't make anything synchronous, of course, I can't. But I have a callback here that is doing some work asynchronously, and a callback there that is chained to the first one. So I could easily say, okay, this second callback, and it must be a callback because it's asynchronous. It doesn't, it may not happen synchronously here because we must wait until we have the value. But this, thanks to the then keyword, not keyword, then method of the promise object, this callback will be called automatically when the first one is uh, available. So what I'm saying here is, at line six, remember what the JavaScript will see. It will only see this, these instructions. Create a promise and uh, call the then method over the promise object. When we call this method, the promise is still empty. But on that object, we are scheduling a callback. And the, the actually, Resolve will be this callback here. When we call resolve, we are actually calling this callback here. And it's all mediated, let's say, by the promise object. So uh, instead of writing this code inside the body, the body of the of the callback, we are putting it outside. We are extracting it. 
some code that should be nested there is now written below. So we have a, you know, a semblance of, synch of uh, synchronicity, at least of sequentiality. First we do that. After that is completed, we know what to do. And we write it outside the callback. And this is the sp step forward. We are writing what to do next outside the function and not inside it, like we had in the callback hell uh, solution before. And of course, if something goes wrong, we also have a catch object, catch method, sorry, that receives a callback, again, which is linked to the reject function that we call the inside the promise. So again, the console.log error, and then we say the error. So we separate the execution of some code from the processing of the value or doing the next steps. In a sequential way, we are creating a chain of callbacks that will be activated in sequence. Okay. So here we focus on uh, executing the query and identifying the result. Later on, then, we focus on using the result. This result uh, will never be user, usable outside any callback, okay? Forget the possibility of using that asynchronously in the main code. It's not possible. But at least you can schedule an easy callback in your code below. And uh, so this is one first step. Uh, the nice part is that uh, um, then and catch themselves return a, a promise object. So when I call then, that's why you see in this code I wrote then dot catch. We have a promise here. I call the then method and then I call the catch on what? On the result of then. Okay? Syn syntactically, then is called some method, dot another method. The second method is called on the result of the first method. We are chaining method calls. But this can be done easily because uh, then and catch return a copy of the same promise. So I can change the methods like that. And even more interesting, if inside the then method, inside the catch method, I return, I create and return another promise object, then I can chain the then of a first promise with the then of the second promise and so on. So I don't know if I have, yeah, some example like that. No. The idea is that, uh, for example, these are some, uh, some code that we can use to query GitHub, for example, with the, with the API. So every time we need to, to query a remote server, it will be an asynchronous uh, operation and so on. And so uh, get repo info, get the repository information, information for the, repository, for the GitHub uh, repository. This method inside will create a promise and return the promise. The asynchronous code in the promise uh, contacts the server, checks the authorization, does all a lot of stuff. And then the promise, when fulfilled, it returns uh, a repository object. So what I'm writing here is I call a function that returns a promise. That doesn't give me the result, but give me the then method that will be called, or whose callback will be called when we have the repository information. It's an object. Then we can call a second function using this parameter. Now we have the parameter, so in the body of this callback, we can use this object. 
is no longer asynchronous, it has been re returned, to call another method, get issue, the issues uh, on, the, on this repository. This is another asynchronous operation that returns a promise. This promise is returned by the callback. This is the normal syntax of the arrow function. This promise is returned by the callback and is returned by the then. And so at this point, we have another promise, which is the promise of the get issue. And this then will execute when the get issue completes with the issue information, which then calls the get owner from this uh, issue object, which is again an asynchronous operation that returns a promise. This promise is returned from the callback, is returned from then. And on this new promise, the issue promise, we call this then. So every, we have a sequence of callbacks uh, that are chained uh, together by promises. A callback generates a promise. When the promise is fulfilled, it will call another callback, which returns a promise that we will call, we will specify another callback and so on. So we are writing code that looks like nearly sequential. Even though we know that everything will be happening in the background, will be happening. Because remember that when our code is here, nothing of this already happened yet. So we just scheduled the first operation. But then we already specified which were the next steps to take. That's the important thing. OK. It's, it takes a while, okay, to, to, to start writing code in this way, okay? So we will start uh, from, uh, um, from simple stuff. The idea is that in our mind, uh, we have a promise object uh, that inside some code has these two functions, resolve, uh, that calls the callback uh, that we specify with then, and rejects that calls the callback that we specify with catch for a single promise. Then we can chain them if the callback of them or, or catch needs to do something asynchronous again, and so it will return, create a return a promise on its own. So in our, um, there's also a um, finally method that will be executed in both cases, if it fails or if it succeeds if you need to, to call it in any way, in any cases, like, uh, I don't know, the important thing is that all these methods all, always return promises, okay? So that's good for, for chaining. The chaining is what gives us the you know, sequential looking code. Otherwise, it would be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get, uh, gain too much, okay? Um, so in our code, so what, what can we do is to restructure this a bit. Right now we have a you know, synchronous code that's trying to do everything in the main. Uh, if I want to have this uh, operation in a function, so let's build a set of functions that we can call to, to build our, our program. Uh, this function could also be methods of our objects. Every method or every function that needs to do some asynchronous operation returns a promise. So if I want to enclose this into a function, it's easy because I just say, okay, um, define a function, function uh, get users, for example. It doesn't need any parameters, but it returns all this. It returns one of, see, this, this, this function has one instruction inside. Create a promise and return it. So whenever I call this function, I'm creating a promise object. And at the same time, I'm starting a sequence of events, of asynchronous events that are the execution, fulfillment of the promise. So 
So in the main code, what I can write is now I say, okay, uh, I want to print uh, the users or the number of users. Nothing easier than say get users. It's a function. In this case, it doesn't have any parameter, but it could have. It returns a promise. So I can't use the result until I just delay the execution until I get the rows. And then I can write uh, I don't know, the number of rows. Like that. Uh, again, we can run it. Where's the terminal? And it, it prints four down here. Which is this uh, row of load, load length. Okay, it's running sometimes. Uh, I, I try it sometimes because uh, there's no guarantee, again, that this print happens after this one. There's no guarantee. It's still a synchronous call. Okay? What the JavaScript code sees is uh, this. Create a promise, create a function, call some methods on this object, which is a promise, and uh, call a method on the result of the function. So call the function and call some method on the result. When I go to line 37, nothing happened yet on the database side. The only thing that executed was the body of get users. These are being executed. These are synchronous call get users. But the body of get users, we know it only contains one instruction. Return your promise, this one. So this instruction has, has already been executed, but none of the queries has been executed yet, or, or, the, or not even this callback has been started yet. So depending on the completion time of these queries, uh, we may see this print statement or this print statement before or after the other. We don't know. We don't care. We shouldn't care. If we care, we must chain them. We must one, have one code chained in the then statement of, of another, of a previous one. Maybe with some result. Okay, but chaining is something that uh, is for a more complex problem for the moment. Uh, um, imagine if I want to insert a new user and tell you the number of the user. So you have two queries, create a new user and print the number. The printed number only comes after or, or may only come after I created the user because I don't know uh, the last ID no, yet. And uh, so in that case, I have two asynchronous operations and, uh, uh, and they, they must be changed into another, okay? So the bottom line is uh, uh, every time we have an asynchronous operation, one good way is to hide that behind the promise object. And let the promise object uh, with the four functions, resolve, reject, uh, and then and catch, uh, which are you know, symmetrical to each, to each other, handle the chain of the methods. Of course, it, we are not forced to do that, okay? We could also do, let's go back to the database without promises. If I wanted to have a function here, without promises, I could do this. I could say function uh, um, get users with a callback. 
Won't there I? Okay. And so I would execute all of this. And in the body, instead of rows for each and whatever, I would write callback uh, of uh, rows. This is the only way before promises. Or still better, I would uh, look like this. If error, callback, error, sorry. As callback, none rows. So before promises, I would program like this. I could still today. So what I mean from the user point of view of this function is that I would call this function get users with a callback error rows that uh, print console.log rows dot length or whatever. Okay, so I can call a function by providing a callback that the function will call when it succeeds. So we don't have the then, the then it will be explicitly managed by creating the callback directly to the function. With promises, we are putting one step in, one intermediate step that separates callback one from callback two through the promise object. And it's easier because this promise object can be passed around, can be stored. Instead here, the caller must actually you know, provide the callback to the, to the function itself. So we cannot just store this function, decide later what to do, or do different things. Okay, so uh, it can be done also with callback, but with promises it's easier in a way. We now I have to create explicitly these promises because the SQLite library doesn't have promises. That's why we selected it, for example, for the example to use today. But in many other libraries, more modern ones, uh, we would never create a promise ourselves, new promise, explicitly. Because all the library functions will already return a promise for us. We'll see one very important one that is the fetch function, which is used to call a remote website that is all, it's a modern function in the standard library of the browsers, and it's all promise based. So we don't even have, we don't even see all this detail mechanism. We just have a promise and call then on the result of it. But whenever we want, we can understand how it's working, okay? So, uh, with this new knowledge, uh, we prepared uh, an exercise that, of course, uh, we are not, uh, we have no hope or, <laughs> say, of, of completing today, but just to understand with this new knowledge about using the database and using asynchronous callbacks, uh, uh, how can we design things? Okay, so uh, may, maybe we implement a couple of uh, methods today and. Uh, we leave it to you to play with it, and then we, I publish the, the, the final result. The idea is that we are trying to uh, link our examples of the question and answers to a database. So we no longer rely on lists in memory to contain the information, but we rely on the database. Every information will be stored in the database. A new question will be sent into the data, data database. Uh, uh, the, the list will be read from the database and so on. So we need to have two objects, uh, which are simpler objects, uh, that just contain the data, that match uh, the, uh, the structure of the tables. Hmm? So for example, we have a, a slide uh, here, we are proposing a slight modification of the question and answer objects because uh, we must have an ID, you know, because the database relies on uh, sequential IDs, so we need also to represent this field in the object and so on. But these are just objects, okay? I already prepared here in the solution this uh, answer object uh, 
ID, text, email, score, and date, and a question object, uh, ID, text, email, and date, and so on. So, nothing special. Basic objects. But now we need to provide some methods uh, to store and manage information in the database. Okay, the database that we already used uh, as an example. The database contains uh, three tables, question, answer, and user. We played with the user table up to now. And the structure of the database is shown here. This new table can go away. I, okay, I can zoom it so we can see. Okay, so this is the database, the simple database that we are going to use uh, in this exercise and in the next weeks also. Okay, so we have a, a question uh, made by an author, and this author is a foreign key to the table of users. Or the author ID is a number that maps uh, to the ID of the user itself, himself, okay, this one. And then we have the name and email uh, of the user. Uh, then the question may be linked to many answers. So every answer has a question ID field that says, this is an answer for this question, the text of the answer, the author of the answer, that is another user. So of course, the user, the author of the question and the author of the answer should be different. In general, they are different. So every answer is the author of the answer and the ID of the question that is referred to. Very simple uh, model with primary keys and foreign keys and data types and so on. Okay, that's what uh, we have in the database. And uh, the exercise is asking us to uh, add some uh, methods uh, on the question object that operate directly on the database. Uh, add answer. Add answer takes, oh, sorry, takes uh, one answer object, so one object of this type, ID, answer, text, respond, and so on, and uh, store it into the database. Get answers gets uh, a list uh, of answers. And the method is described in this way, returns a promise that resolves to an array of the answers. So get answers runs a query, so it must be an asynchronous method. And if it's an asynchronous method, by nature, it will return a promise. So we are not saying the result value. We are saying the resolve value. Which is the value that the promise will resolve to? The list of answers. The array with all the answers. Uh, get top uh, returns a promise that result to an array with the best answers. And then we can uh, um, decide whether this will be a different query or it will be something that changes over get answers. Like we get all the answers and then in code in JavaScript we filter the results or we do the sorting and the filtering on the database with the query. It's up to us. It's a separate query or it's a second callback that say change it to the result of the first query when we implement it. And then um, it asks us to create a new object called question list will be an, that will be an object only contain methods, only containing methods, it doesn't contain any data that manages uh, represents all the questions with this method, add question, get question given ID, and give me all the questions after a given date. Okay? Um, just remember the question, uh, for example, add answer needs uh, to add an, a, an element into the answer table. And also, it, it needs, so it needs also the question ID. That is why add answer is a method of question. 
I know the question, I know the idea of the question. When I add an answer, I can provide this information. Okay. Okay, so uh, and the suggestion here is to implement the method in this order because there are some interdependencies. Okay. So maybe let's start with the first ones until we have time and then we'll continue offline. Okay. We still have 20 minutes to go. So the first one is uh, that is suggested is question list dot get question. Question list dot get question. So we need to create uh, We need to create an object of type question list, function question list, uh, where we have a method called, uh, sorry, I'm going to the wrong window, get question. So it's a method that uh, get question. Uh, returns a promise result of a question with a given ID, with an ID. So it receives an ID. And then does the query to return the object. So since it needs to do a query, it must be asynchronous, and since it's asynchronous, it must return a promise. The first line is always equal. It's always the same. Return, new, promise, callback, um, resolve, reject, arrow, body. And now here we have the code for doing the query. I want an object of type question extracted from the database. So first of all, I need to run the query on the database that corresponds to this question. I know the ID. So for example, uh, yeah. I have, I can write it myself, but I don't, what's the new SQL? Okay. Yeah. I can write something like select everything from uh, question, Q where uh, Q dot ID is equal to two, for example. I always prefer to try the queries outside, <laughs> and then when the query is debugged, I can cut and paste it into the code. Oh, so this is what, uh, what we need to receive. And this will give me the ID, text, author ID, and date. Are these, are these all the information that we need to build a question object? Let's see. The question object, ID, text, email, date. ID, text, email, date. ID, text. No, we don't have the email. We only have the author ID. And the question object uh, wants uh, an email. So we need to extract the email from the user table. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we need to join with the user table. User. Uh, and so we join and uh, Q dot uh, author ID equal u dot ID. This is the join condition. u dot ID. Hmm? Why are you red? I don't know. And uh, so right now we need to select uh, the question ID, the um, text question text, uh, then we have the email of the user, u.email, and uh, the date, q.date. Okay. 
And if I run it, okay, I have the ID, text, email, and date. Don't ask me why he's complaining about the email and ID because they are very, ah, okay, because user is a, is a reserve keyword also. Okay, so it prefers to have it like this. So the name of a table is also a reserved word and it gets confused with the syntax. So this is the, the, the query that we want to run. Of course, with two being a parameter, our ID parameter. So let's go into here, into this promise. Let's, let's create the query. Const SQL is I'm using the back tick so that they can expand multiple lines. Okay, and uh, instead of the two, I need to put a parameter. And now I, I, I can run the query. DB dot, uh, uh, no, not DB, sorry. There's no DB yet. I need to create a connection to the database. I can create a, a new one for the whole project. Instead of uh, opening a connection in every method, I can do as we did before, open the database here, and FDB as a global variable. Okay, so this. Okay. So now I have this DB object. I can write, I only need uh, one question, so it's a DB.get. SQL string, parameters, question ID. Callback. We are in the SQLite, so the callback will be error row. And now it's easier. If we have an error, then reject the promise with the error message, with the error object. Else, uh, we return, so we resolve. What is the, uh, the value that we want to provide out of this promise? Let's check the text. Uh, result to a question object with the given ID. So we must build a question object from the fields in the database. So new question with the row.id, row.text, row.email, djs, row.date. Uh, just remember, just notice this else statement. Because before, when we had a throw exception, the throw will termi terminate the method. If we have just an if, uh, we don't want to resolve and, re and, um, and reject to be executed both, okay? So we must uh, either have a return here or an else. Uh. So this should work. We hope. Let's try to call it. Uh, let's say that we have a question list. We create this object, const all, let's say, or question list, list, queue list. And on this queue list, we can call methods. So we can say that the, the, the first question, Q1, can be extracted from question list dot get question number one. Well, of course, this doesn't work because this will be a promise. Q1 would be a promise, okay? So it's not the real question object. 
The real question object would be only available in the callback, in the then callback. So if I want to show this, to see the, the object itself, I must say Q1, which you are promised, when so fulfilled, then you can print it. Uh, so callback, cons body, console.log, Q1, the object. So let's try it. So we have this code here. Uh, what's wrong? Uh, ah, DJS, I didn't import npm install DJS because we are in a different folder. We just created the, the npm project, uh, we installed it. Um, SQLite, but not the JS. So right now, okay. So it's telling me the question ID number one as this text, uh, this email, and the date is, uh, it looks like a DJS object. Uh, maybe we can write uh, to string, uh, we, since we have the method to make it more readable. Uh, no, sorry. Oh, stupid me, sorry, that's the problem. Uh, then receive a value, and I can print the value. I forgot to extract the value itself. I was printing the promise, which is q dot uh, um, to string. Okay. This is what we are printing. We don't have the list of questions anymore. Every time we need a question, we go to the database. So I don't care that I'm not storing this result uh, anywhere. It would be complex because, uh, as we saw before, if we define a data structure here at the top level, it will always be empty because all the asynchronous methods can, will come later. Hmm? Uh, we are still in a strange position in which we are writing uh, asynchronous function, but we are calling them from asynchronous main. Quite a strange. When we go to the next step uh, using the browser, also the color itself will be asynchronous, so that it will be much more natural. Hmm? Right now we are just building this test statement to see that everything is working, but hmm, usually the query we should start when some external events happen, not, not when we are writing the code. Okay, next uh, function is uh, add question. Okay, add question will simply receive a fully constructed question object and uh, store it into database. Okay, and it's always a method of all question list. Okay, let's play with that. Uh, we are in question list and we add a second method. Oops, this dot add question. Q. This one gets a parameter, sorry, equal function, Q. Uh, does this method return anything? Does this method need to return anything? So it can return a success status, maybe. So something that will tell me whether it, there was an error or the element was really added. It may also return, if we want, the question ID. Hmm? Uh, the ID field in the database is uh, 
No, it's a normal integer without an auto increment. We should probably give an auto increment here. Uh, the, the, the issue is uh, which ID do I provide? The question object uh, contains an ID. But when I store a new question, I should ensure that this ID is unique. Okay? So one possibility could be to uh, query for the maximum value of the ID and uh, define, increment it by one. Which would be somewhat dangerous because if I query database, I get an ID. Maximum ID is four, okay. Now I increment it by one and I store a new question with ID five. But while, what happens if in the middle, some other process, some other user, asked for the same number four and decided that the next one, the next free one was five. So I would have two different uh, users thinking that they both own number five. Uh, this is a problem that we'll, we'll face uh, when making client server, uh, say, um, applications, okay? Um, in this case, we only have one program running, so we know that uh, we are not uh, incrementing twice the same number. Uh, so for the moment, uh, it's not a problem that concerns us yet. We are in the execution of one method, and this method will always run to, to completion. But uh, let's, keep in, let's keep that in mind, okay? So from the question list method, uh, the, the text uh, is quite uh, simple and uh, says, add question, pass a fully constructed question object. And so I assume that the question object is already mm, with, the, with the right numbers. It's not a good assumption, but for the moment that the exercise only asks this. So we assume that Q already has all the fields that we need. And we just need to insert that into the database. So we need to run an insert query into the question table. How does it look like? So let's make a new query like it will be an insert statement. Insert into the name of the fields, right? If I remember correctly the syntax, uh, well, that would be ID, text, author, ID, and date. ID, text, author, ID, ID, and date. Values. And the values would be, let's try to put something just to validate the syntax. 99, ABC, then I will delete it. Uh, the author ID is two, and the date uh, is today, 2024, 3.19. Okay, does it look like a good syntax? Run. So, uh, error missing database near missing database near. Uh, no, the, the table into question. Okay. Updated rows one. And we see, let's have a look at the, at the questions table the data, we refresh it, yes, now it has a row. Okay, so I know the syntax, now let me delete this row, and uh, save the deletion, okay. 
I just played with the database to, to ensure that I remember the syntax of the query. Const SQL is this query here, where of course the values will be all parameters. Question mark, question mark, question mark, and question mark. This is the query that we want to run. And we may return a promise, return, no, sorry. Uh, Yes, it's the same. We can, before I created the, the SQL inside the promise, I can do that outside, it, it, it's the same. I, I didn't remember what I did. It's a, sorry, go away. It's accessible anyway. So this is just a string that we use for the query, return new promise. Uh, the parameters are resolve, reject, and then you have the body. Inside of the body, we run the query, so it will be a db.run, because it's an insert statement, the query, and the parameters. The parameters should be in order, the question ID, so from the object Q, we take uh, the ID, so we must just be careful with the order. The second parameter is the text, q.text, okay. then we have the uh, email, really? no, so we have a problem here, because uh, uh, in the database we need an author ID, and in the Q object we have the email. So at this point, we should run first a query for telling me the ID of the user with this email. You see the problem? Here I have a Q. Q contains email, but the database needs author ID. So, okay. Author ID should be defined in some way. Let's write it and then we, we think how, how to extract the information, okay? And then we'll be, we have uh, uh, Q dot, uh, the last one was the date, uh, but of course we must, we must format that uh, because date is a DJS object and the database just wants a, a string, okay? We must format with the ISO format, uh, uh, which I don't remember if something like that. I'm not, I'm not so sure, but. Uh, and uh, so it, this still has to be debugged, okay? It's not complete. Well, I'm just trying to, to, to get to finish okay, the, the thought uh, before the, the time runs over and then we correct it. But, uh, so after this, it's a run, and the run statement also has the callback. The usual callback with, an er with a possible error message. Remember, we have a, uh, okay. And so we can say that if we have an error, then we need to reject the promise with the error message. As we can uh, res uh, resolve the promise with no value. In this case, we don't have any value to provide. It just succeeded. You want to return true, you want to return success, a string, whatever. There's not really nothing with a meaning. The fact that it succeeded is the information. Okay? And so this is the case in which uh, The success is just the termination of the, of the operation. So we can change with a then saying, okay, I insert, and then after I'm sure it doesn't be insert, inserted, I do something else. Otherwise, I could just ignore it. In my code, I don't need to manage, uh, um, I could just write question list, 
uh, add dot add question with a given question q2 say imagine and this will run the query will run the insert and I will not be informed when it will complete maybe I don't care I just trust that it goes it may happen Uh, or if I want to do something, then I will change then, or you want to, if I want to manage the errors, I will change a catch, and so on. It's up to me. Once the promise is started, it will run upon completion. If I want, I can decide what to change next after this operation. Okay, the last words is, uh, uh, how do I get authority? I need to make another query. Okay, so I should implement another method here just for converting emails to authorities. This query will provide me an asynchronous value. So in that case, all of this, this promise should only be run after we get the result of the first one. So we need to do a bit of a promise chaining. We compute the, we call the method, it will be something like this. It will be this dot uh, convert ID, email to ID. To ID. It will return a promise that when it's completed, I will take the ID. And then I return a promise with uh, all the code that I have below. It's not apply. Dot, dot, dot. With something like this. Okay. In this statement, first we run the other query. When the, pro when the query is finished, we get the ID. That is the only information that we need. And we create a new promise with all the new query that I'm running in this method. And the result of it will be, again, the promise that the user can resolve. Okay, this is the idea. I will complete that and we publish the, the final result. Okay? So, that's all for today. Thank you. And see you next week.